Hi, this is a podcast from the Physician Patient Alliance for Health and Safety. The podcast that we're presenting today is called Five Keys to Successful Monitoring of Patients Receiving Opioids. Welcome to our podcast. My name is Pat Iyer, and I am a nurse. I have with me today Harold Oglesby, who is a respiratory care practitioner. He's a manager for the Center for Pulmonary Health at SJC, and this program is generously supported by Medtronic and EarlySense. As a global leader in medical technology, services, and solutions, Medtronic improves the health and lives of millions of people every year. Our second sponsor is EarlySense. They deliver continuous monitoring solutions designed to enhance proactive patient care for non-ICU general care patients. Since June 2004, SJC has more than 10 years of patient safety. Harold, could you tell our listeners what event-free means? Sure. For us, event-free means that we have uh, been free of adverse events that have resulted in patient harm. Could you give our listeners a little bit of background about St. Joseph's Candler Health System, where it is, how large it is? Sure. St. Joseph's Candler Health Care System consists of two of the oldest continuously operating hospitals in the United States. St. Joseph and Candler uh, combined uh, has 675 beds, We're located in southeast coastal Georgia in the beautiful town of Savannah, Georgia. We have about 25,000 annual uh, discharges from our facilities, and we're a tertiary uh, referral center for our area. Tell us about why your facility decided to focus on reducing events and what they decided to focus on. Well, uh, the reason we decided to focus on it was because we were having too many negative adverse outcomes. Uh, One is too many, but we were having more than we were comfortable with. And we did it out of an effort to ensure uh, patient safety. And specifically, what did you decide to focus on? Which group of patients? So uh, initially, our decision was to look at uh, patients receiving opioid therapy via PCA because that was the area that uh, we had had several um, incidences um, with patients that were having outcomes that we thought we could have done better. So Mm -hmm. uh, we looked at that area to see what we could do to make our patients have a better outcome. Did you focus on purchasing any particular type of equipment to deal with this issue? So what we did was we had a, a team that got together to figure out the best way that we could um, address this. And at the time, we had the Alaris system, and there was an opportunity to look at um, PCA and capnography using that platform and having everything on one platform. So that is the equipment that we decided to use. For the people who are listening to this podcast who are not familiar with Alaris, could you explain what that is? Sure. The Alaris pump is an infusion pump. And their platform offers the uh, infusion, PCA, entitled CO2, and SpO2 on one platform. Uh, was all integrated, so there was no hunting for parts and pieces. We had it, everything in one one place. Okay. In terms of implementing this, did you start in one specific area, or did you purchase the equipment and use it throughout the facility? We, we did a, a, some beta testing um, to see if what we believed to be the case was going to be the case. Uh, we actually started off um, initially in a large way uh, with it being throughout the facility. So it wasn't small steps, it was one big step. And did you find any lessons learned as a result of doing it large scale? Sure, we did find some lessons learned, and um, one of one of the lessons learned was um, was about educating and making sure everybody knew what they were looking at, um, and making sure that the team was aware and well educated on uh, capnography as well as the patients. Where is 
is that equipment being used now? Uh, currently, it's used throughout the facility. So almost any area that you find a patient, you may find um, that equipment in it now. Uh, the main areas that it's used is our, for our um, pain patients that are receiving PCA therapy. Uh, so you'll often find it um, in, in our PACU, in our post-op patients that are on our floors. Uh, but you wouldn't be surprised uh, to find it in almost any area of our facility. Could you give our listeners a tip related to this specific point that you would like to share? So, you know, the first tip that I would give them is that uh, don't wait for a patient death or an adverse event to occur to be proactive and implement um, some type of continuous monitoring for your patients before you um, get behind the eight ball and you have a bad outcome. That would be my first tip. Terrific. I know that you chose capnography over pulse oximetry in terms of your monitoring technology. What was the rationale behind that? So when we did our beta testing, there were a couple of questions that were raised. Um, and one of the first questions that was asked of the respiratory team was, which monitor would provide the earliest indicator of a patient's decline in ventilation? And we felt if you had a reliable piece of equipment, a capnography device, that it would give you the earliest indication of changes in ventilation versus SpO2. One of the issues with SpO2 is sometimes um, hypoventilation could be masked. Um, by the time the patient starts to desaturate, you're probably a little bit further down the road than you need to be. But one of the things that often happens when a patient desats is uh, the first response is to put them on additional supplemental oxygen, which further masks the patient's true uh, issue, which would likely be uh, a ventilation problem. And when we did our beta testing, we, we saw that uh, happening in real life. That was a couple of the aha moments uh, when we saw that capnography was giving us sometimes an hour earlier indicator of a patient that was getting into distress. So uh, that was one of the first aha moments. Mm -hmm. Did you have to go through some changes to make sure that this new system would work? Sure. We went through uh, a lot of uh, changes initially. Remember, this was about 10 years ago, so we were the first folks to actually put this out on the floors in the general care area for all of our PCA patients. And um, the devices, the capnography, um, works really, really well in the ICU and the intubated patient works really well in the OR and OR intubated patients that are hopefully stable. But now we we're talking about putting it out on the floors on patients who were having um, a variety of ventilatory statuses. They would come back from the OR usually pretty well sedated and then they would wake up and they would want to walk, they would want to talk, they would want to eat. So we saw that the algorithms had to be adjusted to deal with the situation that we were dealing with because we were having uh, alarms and readings that weren't accurate. So we worked with the manufacturer and we um, revised the algorithms so that the algorithms made sense. And then when the machine was counting breaths, it was counting actual breaths. And the other issue was our patients who initially came back from the OR, or even our patients at night, a lot of them would breathe through their mouths and um, not enough CO2 would be collected at the nasal cannula, and that's when we aided the team and developed uh, the, uh, the cannula that has the uh, aperture that goes over the patient's mouth so they can collect additional CO2. Once we had those uh, shortcomings uh, fixed, uh, we had a device that worked well. I know that in order for these initiatives to work, you have to have a clinical team that works together and communicates and plans. How did the clinical staff function together to tackle those changes that needed to be made? And I think that was a, that was a big a big plus for us is that we started off with the appropriate people uh, making some decisions from the get go. So on our initial team, nursing, respiratory pharmacy, some physician leadership, 
we're all on the same team looking at the process of implementing, looking at what drugs uh, were going to be uh, monitored, what patients were going to be monitored, uh, trying to come up with algorithms for patients to, to monitor, and how we're going to educate everybody. And that uh, aspect of it, of having everybody initially together, not only aided in having the right people at the table, but it also gave everybody on the team some ownership of the process. So nobody felt like they were being imposed on or anything was being pushed on and everybody had some stake in the uh, transition and everybody knew that the reason we were doing it was for our patient safety. Yeah, that's an excellent point. How would you categorize your second tip related to this topic? Uh, my, my second tip would be to make sure that you have respiratory therapy as an integral part of the process. And, and I say that because one of the challenges if you decide to use this type of technology is going to be the implementation process. And respiratory therapists tend to have the expertise in dealing with capnography outside of the OR. Um, they understand it. They can um, relate that understanding not only to the patients but also to the uh, staff on the floors that may not be used to monitoring a patient with capnography. One of the um, things that we found with our respiratory therapists is that um, we looked and leaned on them for their expertise. We made them an integral part by uh, having them monitor the patients. And what they actually do is go on the floor uh, and see these patients at least once during the shift. Or if a nurse has an issue with a capnography device or she has questions about a patient, she can call a respiratory therapist. They will come up there and monitor the patient. Part of their assessment uh, when they're making their rounds on this patient includes an assessment of the respiratory rate, their respiratory effort, what their SpO2 is, what their entitled CO2 is. The other key thing that they look at is they look at the patient's entitled CO2 trend. Uh, we know that the numbers on certain patients are not going to be matching uh, blood gas numbers, but the trend that we observe on those patients tells us a lot. If we see a patient that is trending in the wrong direction, then we take some interventions before the patient has significant changes. Uh, the other thing they look at is they look at the amount of medication that the patient has received. So they look at that on the monitor, those two items. They look at the trend of medication delivery. They look at the trend of entitled CO2, and they can put uh, two and two together and assess the patients. The last few things they look at are they look at the patient's sedation scale. They look at the patient's level of consciousness, the level of activity, and their pain score. We often hear from clinical staff that too many alarms are sounding, which is what prevents them from using patient monitoring more extensively. In a national survey we conducted across 40 states in the United States, 90% of the hospitals believed that reducing false alarms would increase the use of patient monitoring devices like pulse oximeters and capnography. And this survey was conducted before the Joint Commission made better alarm management a patient safety goal. What has your facility done to avoid those nuisance alarms? Well, that's, a, that's another key of having a respiratory therapy actively involved. So if you were to go to one of our machines, our default settings are very, very wide. Our high entitled CO2 at the default is 60. Our low entitled CO2 defaults at 6. Our no breath uh, detected is 30 seconds. Our high respiratory rate uh, is set at 35, and our low respiratory rate is set at 6. So those, some of those numbers scare some people when they hear them. Mm, there but the key yeah, is that we have a respiratory therapist that will go and monitor the patient, look at their trends, and set the alarms based on what's happening with the patient at the bedside. So if we have a COPD patient on the floors and say his CO2 on a normal day is 55, we know that we can increase his high entitled CO2 alarms. Conversely, if we have a patient that's walkie, talky, that's running lower entitled CO2s, we can manipulate the settings to meet the patient's needs. Uh, so we have a lot less uh, nuisance alarms than we would have if we had closer uh, defaults. And the fact that we can tailor the 
the alarms to the patient is a big plus. And then the, uh, other, the other part of that is the fact that the respiratory therapists not only see them on the day shift, but they also see them on the night shift. So some patients change from day to night. So when you're asleep, you may have an increase in your CO2. You may breathe a little bit slower, uh, but we, again, adjust those alarms to meet the patient's need at that time so that the nursing staff isn't constantly called into the room for alarms that they likely shouldn't be. It takes a little work, but for the patient and for the safety side, it's a, it's a positive for everybody involved. No, you cut down on the number of nuisance alarms, and you're still protecting the patient. So what you're describing is really individualizing this according to the patient's condition and needs. That's correct. How would you encapsulate that third tip? You know, the third tip when, you know, the alarm sounds, find out what needs to be adjusted and treat the patient, not the monitor, is, is a key. Uh, a lot of times, when, particularly initially when we went through the implementation process, uh, staff, particularly the nursing staff, and some physicians who are unfamiliar with catnography were calling the respiratory therapist to the bedside saying this alarm is going off, there's no reason for it to be going off, and we, would, we instructed the respiratory therapist to go into the room with the nursing staff or with the physician and look at the patient, look at the monitor, see what's going on. So the first thing they always look at is the patient. And sometimes you solve the problem just by looking at the patient. It could be as simple as a cannula is not in the patient's nose, it's over by the ear. Putting the cannula where it needs to be sometimes will solve the problem. Other times you would look at the patient, and the patient is, looks fine, so you know that you're going to be okay. You have time to assess everything else that you're looking for. We go over to the monitor, pull up the trend screens, look at the screens, uh, look at the patient's entitled CO2, look at the patient's SpO2 and look at the total picture. There were times that you would find that the patient, particularly at night, would um, actually be having apnea. Um, and sometimes when you walk in the room, it will wake the patient up. So when, you, when the nurse would come in to assess the patient, the patient would talk to them and tell them that the machine kept going off. But in actuality, the machine was going off because the patient had some apnea. The percentage of patients that we felt were demonstrating undiagnosed sleep apnea was significant, uh, and some of those patients were referred to our sleep lab uh, post-hospital visit just to assess whether it was actually uh, sleep apnea or whether it was uh, medication-induced. So um, looking at the patient and figuring out why the alarms are going off is, is always another key. It cuts down on your nuisance alarms. Mm-hmm. We've heard from patients that wearing the nasal cannula for capnography can be uncomfortable. Is there something that you have found that's successful in encouraging patients to wear the cannula? So one of the one of the patient populations that I was really concerned about uh, was our non-compliant patients who have sickle cell anemia who require significant amounts of pain management and pain medications to overcome their pain. Uh, and with those folks wearing the entitled CO2. Initially, it was, it was an issue. It was an issue not only with those patients, but with our um, general patients out on the floors. Again, we were introducing a new device onto the floors. Um, the nursing staff, some of them weren't as familiar with the devices. And what was happening was the patient education at the bedside was poor. The um, patient would have come from surgery, have the entire CO2 cannula placed on them, and they would get a response, something like, Okay, you got to wear this it's because they tell us we have to wear these devices now. I'm not sure why you're wearing it, but that's what you can't have it. You can't have your pain medication unless you wear the cannula. So the patients weren't getting um, a full disclosure of why they were wearing the nasal cannulas. So we developed some patient um, handouts that were customized to our organization, and we pulled back the nursing staff and re-educated the nursing staff on how to educate the patients. So then the education went more like, you know, Mr. Davis, we're putting this cannula on you for your safety. It's here to protect you. We talked about some of the poor outcomes. We had some of the families visit the uh, PromiseAmanda.org um, site to look at some of the poor outcomes that have happened to patients that weren't monitored. 
you know, we told them, this is for your benefit, this is for your safety. If you hear it go off, first thing I want you to do is take a deep breath. If nobody responds in a time in which you feel is a timely fashion, call us, we'll come down immediately. Once the family's got that education and the patient's got that education, our compliance shot out of the roof. Our sickle cell patients were still a bit of a challenge, but one of the benefits for them was a lot of the nursing staff, particularly the newer nurses, were um, reluctant sometimes to give those patients the amount of medication they needed to overcome their pain. When they start seeing these high doses come across the screens. They were, again, reluctant because they didn't know where they were going to cross over that threshold and over-sedate their patients. Having them on the PCA pump with the entitled CO2 gave them a backup so they knew that if the patient got a little bit too much medication that they would see some changes in their monitoring. So those patients actually ended up getting better pain control, and, and they're pretty smart people. And they learned that um, by wearing a cannula and being monitored that they can receive better pain management. So a couple of things happened from that. It helps your HCAP scores because now the patients feel as though um, their pain is being better managed. There's an additional person that's um, asking them about pain. So when the pain question comes up, if anybody addressed your pain, you may see your pain scores look a little bit better. But compliance was improved just because we did a better job of educating the patients of why they were wearing the cannulas. And you mentioned a few minutes ago a website called Promise Amanda. Did I get that right? Yes, ma'am. Could you tell us a little bit about that website for the listeners who are not familiar with that? Sure. So I can tell you um, one of the things that came up when we were initially looking at um, the PCA and the entitled CO2 devices and pulse oximetry was placing capnography on every PCA phone is expensive, and that's what our organization did. Our organization, I think we had a total of 68 PCAs, and we put an entitled CO2 on every one of those PCAs, which is expensive. Um, so the, initially one of the questions was, all right, if we don't buy entitled CO2 for everybody, how can we differentiate which patients we're going to put on capnography versus which patients we don't? And if you go to the amandapromise.org website, you'll see that a lot of the patients that had bad, bad outcomes, that didn't walk out of the hospital, aren't those patients that would fit into any algorithm that says you need to monitor this patient. Those type of patients, you know, it's the 21-year-old guy that comes in for a knee surgery and has, has PCA by proxy or whatever. Those patients, uh, it was... We couldn't differentiate which patients to monitor versus which patients you couldn't because you never know which patient is going to have the bad outcome. And um, when we show our, our patients and we show our staff some of the stories on there, it kind of hits home for them that, oh, my God, maybe it's not the little frill um, COPD patient that I really need to be worried about. Maybe I need to be worried about every patient that's getting opioid therapy within the facility. Um, and that, that was part of the reason we decided that if we were going to do it, we just had to go full house and do the whole thing. And when we did our return on investment, um, we without any negative outcomes, the devices paid for themselves a couple times over at least. Well, you brought up an important point that some of the people who develop respiratory compromise are not the obvious people that would trigger alarms. At the Physician Patient Alliance for Health and Safety, we have done some features and have done at least one podcast related to patients who died as a result of overdoses or respiratory compromise associated with opioids. And these were people who had no obvious medical issues before being sent home. Some of them were about ready to be discharged or had been discharged and then developed problems. What guidance can you offer clinicians about this type of patient? My guidance would be to um, never assume who's going to be uh, a good patient versus who's going to be a troublesome patient, that you monitor all the patients the same way, that you're vigilant with all your patients, and that you 
to note uh, the changes when you um, see them happening. And if you hear an alarm on any patient, um, particularly when you know that you have those parameters set appropriately that you uh, pay attention to them and address them in a timely fashion, you do those sort of things, you'll, you'll save patients. There'll be times when you might go in and a cannula might be on the patient's ear or the patient may have taken it off, but it's that, that's that time that you go in and that your patient's um, laying in bed and breathing four times a minute with the entitled CO2 of 60 and a saturation of uh, 80, and you catch that patient, and instead of going to the ICU, you, you save them on the floor, and they get to go home instead of uh, going to a funeral home. That would make a big difference not only to you, but, of course, to the family and to the patient. So um, never assuming and always being vigilant about monitoring your patients would be my uh, strongest suggestion. Yeah, complacency can get us every time. That is correct. How would you summarize that last tip on this topic? So I would say that, um, you know, the eyeball test is not always a good predictor of who is going to need more attention and who may not. So continuous monitoring has been a huge plus for us, but it will never replace the human factor. Uh, you have to put your eyeballs on the patients, observe the patients, know what's going on with your patients, know their histories, know where they're at, know what they look like uh, the day before, know what they looked at it's like at the beginning of the shift, to know any changes, monitor them closely, and then pray they have good outcomes. And then the last point that I thought we would cover is that we started talking about the fact that your facility has had 10 years free of events. And I know from what you've talked about that you have saved lives. Has anyone at the hospital ever calculated how many dollars you have saved as a result of having that event-free record? Yes, it's been, it's been calculated and it's been published. Um, so if you were to um, do a Google search for uh, Dr. Ray Maddox and entitled CO2 PCA, you will find a study that he and our CNO uh, did on the return of investment for the devices that we purchased. And it's a significant number, and I believe it's, I know it's over a million dollars, and again, it's, it's a very significant uh, cost savings for our organization. And the um, return on investment figure that they have in that article doesn't include the avoidance of litigation um, for many bad outcomes. So it's going to be a significant number, but if you were to attempt to calculate litigation associated with poor outcomes, it would be even higher. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Well, thank you. We've been talking with Harold Oglesby, who is a respiratory care practitioner, who is the manager of the Center for Pulmonary Health of Candler Hospital and St. Joseph's Candler Health System. Harold, thank you for sharing that wonderful insight with us, and I hope that it will inspire our listeners to take a good look at the key concepts and the tips that you have shared with us in this program. Well, thank you for having me. And this program is generously supported by Medtronic and EarlySense. As a global leader in medical technology, services, and solutions, Medtronic improves the health and lives of millions of people every year. Medtronic believes its deep clinical, therapeutic, and economic expertise can help address the complex challenges such as rising costs, aging populations, and the burden of chronic disease faced by families and healthcare systems today. But Medtronic can't do it alone. That's why Medtronic is committed to partnering in new ways and developing powerful solutions that deliver better patient outcomes. Our second sponsor is EarlySense. They deliver continuous monitoring solutions designed to enhance proactive patient care for non-ICU general care patients. The EarlySense system provides continuous and contact-free monitoring of heart rate, respiratory rate, and motion for early detection of patient deterioration, fall prevention, and pressure ulcer prevention.